Well, good morning again. Today is our sixth week into this series, going back to Genesis 3, the question that Satan asked Eve, did God really say? And we've been exploring a lot of different topics and things. Uh, we already discussed the questions, did God really say he just wants me to be happy? And the answer was, no, God is more concerned with other things than your happiness. Not that he's not concerned about happiness, but his highest priority was your holiness and your drawing closer to him. Uh, another question was, did God really say he helps those who help themselves? And the answer was yes and no, depending on what you mean by that. If you mean uh, that God has provided the church to help people who are in need, then the answer is yes. If you're talking about an aspect of working your way to heaven, that if, if I just try to do good things and God will balance the scales for me, that is absolutely not true. Um, uh, but God has done all the work on that because you cannot help yourself. Uh, and then I think maybe even last week, was last week wisdom? I think we did wisdom last week, right? Did God really say that his wisdom is better than man's? And the answer we explored a multitude of ways is yes, in so many ways beyond what we can imagine. So today we're going to get to one, but in the next few weeks, uh, this week I hope to lay out even farther into maybe September or October. Uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about questions like, do miracles still happen today? A lot of you had asked several questions that were kind of related around that, so we'll try to, I'll try to put them all in there for, I think that's next week. Uh, and then, did God really say there's a heaven and hell and people go there? Uh, and somebody asks, so what happens to the soul of a person when they cease to be living on this earth? We'll throw that in with that one as well. Uh, and as I said, I'm not sure what the rest of the series questions are going to be. We had lots of questions about uh, abortion and retirement and creation and evolution. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I can't cram into one week. Like if we were to explore all the creation evolution stuff, that would take, that's a whole summer series in itself. Maybe we'll just have to push that one back. But anyway, so a lot of those things I feel like we've covered in the past, especially when we talk about issues of, of gender and sexuality and so forth. I know we've talked about those and uh, just for a clear explanation, there's always those documents uh, of where the church stands on the, in the cafe on that little table there. Uh, so there may be a week near the end where we got some questions that I thought, well, that's not really a whole sermon. That's about three or four paragraphs. There may be a week where we just take three or four questions and try to do them all on that Sunday. Uh, so, but today we come to a claim that you have likely heard from people who consider themselves um, to be a person of faith and perhaps even a devout Christian uh, and they don't go to church. You've probably heard someone say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. We're going to explore that concept today. But I wanted to start, first off, we're going to break into some small groups in a minute. But I want to show uh, a stat first. Can you put that on the screen for us, Harrison? Uh, this is from LifeWay Research. It said in 2019, just a mere three years ago, 34% of Americans attended a religious service at least once or twice a month. One year later, in 2020, that fell to 31%, and then fell another uh, 3% in 2021, and we're now in 2022. Um, the pandemic, we can talk about that. It had, it had a lot to do with that, with some of that at points, but we'll talk about that as well. But the question for today is, did God really say, I have to go to church? But I want you to take some time and to dig into that this morning, because we're going to put a question on the screen that I know I have heard before, uh, and it sounds like a very, uh, a very good argument for this. But here's the, here's the saying I've heard. Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. <laughs> so discuss. Uh, what I want you to do is break into groups. It can be groups of any. We've, in the past, we did different groups of two to six. And there's three questions that I want you to respond to that statement, first of all. And then, so that's, well, that's the first question. How would you respond if somebody said that to you? Uh, and then second question is, why do people ask this question? Why do, or, or does God really say I have to go to church? What are the reasons that somebody might say that? And then the third one is, what do you think God and Scripture really say about it? So try to come to some sort of a group conclusion. But go ahead, and we'll spend a couple minutes breaking two to six, whatever. Uh, just don't leave somebody by themselves. At least try to have a little bit of a discussion to work through that. Well, I want to hear some of your combined wisdom on how you would respond to this statement. Sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. What would you, how would you respond to that? I actually want to hear some of your responses. You had nothing? A car can't give me a hug. Okay. We're not comparing cars and Christians. We're using a 
like as like just because I, you're in a garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you're in a church doesn't make you a Christian. We don't want to compare cars and Christians. It's, that's a world apart. But, but you are not incorrect that a car cannot give you, although we might be right around the corner that cars are hugging you. But. Right. Yeah, the, the pandemic certainly changed how, how interactive we are. I mean, we used to do fellowship, but I remember pre-pandemic, we used to do fellowship and there'd be people around hugging everywhere and, and then we kind of spent two or three years separated from each other and we're afraid to shake hands anymore. Somebody else have a response to that about sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Yeah, they're using what seems to make sense. I'll, I'll respond to that in, in, in a little bit, but yeah. Uh, you're going to run into a lot, of, a lot of these issues that we're discussing in this series. There are things that sound really good that make sense. And it is also true. In almost every church, there's somebody in there who's not a Christian. Uh, so what are some of the reasons that people had for saying that? Because they don't want to go to church, right? <laughs> That's, most often the people that say this are those who have no interest in church or not engaged or uh, any energy to go there. Um, yeah, you get to sleep in. Right, and that's where I'm going to go too. So, so let's let's get into this a little bit. I'm just kind of we're just skimming the surface with those questions of what we're going to get into today. Um, mm-hmm. Right, and you don't get to play the piano at home. Nobody gets to hear you play, so we miss it when you're not here. Uh, the pandemic, uh, and certainly the closing, and I want to be really honest about this, the last three years have really drastically changed, and like I referred to the way we do church, the way everybody does church, uh, mostly for the worse, I would have to say, um, but it really, what it did was it caused more people to believe that going to church is not important, because all of a sudden, every church, even this one, that was not available online, that was, I can tell you from this side of it, that was Every church's goal was to be, all of a sudden, we're streaming our services now since we weren't for that six, eight, eight weeks, whatever long it was there in March 2022. And the people that began to stream at home and just watch services online on their TV, computer, whatever, they got comfortable with that. And it's really easy to just click. I mean, we've had TV preachers for, you know, for years now. Uh, and people got really comfortable watching from the comfort of their living room, wearing a robe, having a cup of coffee, because nobody could see them, right? And they can still hear what the, the, the pastors are going to say. And it's, um, it's easier, in that case, to not participate, to not go to church, to not do anything. Um, it's easy to not get out of bed and get dressed. Any of us who have missed church for an extended period of time realize that, hey, this Sunday's, I, I, I can remember, I forget what I was doing at the time, but I was some, I think I was on vacation or something and watching on a Sunday morning like, wow, this doing nothing on a Sunday morning is all right. Uh, and because I've been doing something on Sunday morning for, you know, years now. Uh, but it's easy to not get out of bed and get dressed and get prepared and go to church. And I understand as a, um, as a, as a father of three young kids what a difficult task it was to get young kids up and get them dressed and get them to church. Unfortunately, I think that's mainly who the pandemic and streaming affected the most is those who had young kids and realized how easy it was to not have to get those kids out of bed or let them come downstairs and eat their bowl of cereal while the preacher preaches. Um, so we're going to talk about all that, but we have to be, that's the reality of the world that we live in, so let's talk about that. Maybe a better question would be, why do you go to church? Or why should you go to church? Karen kind of answered that for us a little bit already. She likes seeing people's face and the hugs and, and so forth. And, and it's really a question of if the value of you going to church, if the value of that, of what you think you receive back, is greater than the difficulty of going to church. It's really just a question of if I go to church, and what am I going to get out of it? Does it benefit me more than staying home? Can I just watch a TV preacher or online streaming and get just the same amount out of it? Uh, many people feel that the return that they receive on going to church, the return on that investment is just not high enough. It's just not worth the cost, the time, the effort. It's not, I don't receive more joy from going to church than I do from my Sunday morning cup of coffee and newspaper. 
Um, so the question then becomes, do you go to church to receive something or to give something? All right, there's two different sides to this equation. You see what we've, where, we've, where we've arrived at now. Do you go there for what you get out of it or you, do you go there to be obedient? First off to scripture, I heard Hebrews 10 back here and we'll get to that. To, to serve God, is it a place where you can engage with other people? You encourage fellow believers, are you encouraged? Is it a place where you go to worship God, to be obedient and to serve? Or is it just a thing? So, as Creighton has said, the statement, sitting in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a, gar in a garage makes you a car. It's true. But then if you think about that a little bit more, neither does sitting at home or anywhere else make you more of a Christian. And let's think about this. Where else should sinners be? Where else should people who are broken and need help and encouragement be than in church? We've often talked about the church is, is not a museum, it's a hospital. It's not a museum of ancient relics, it's a hospital for sinners and people who realize that we're broken and this life is a struggle. It's a place we go to get help. So a lot of this is reframing how we think about church in itself. But and my response to that question would be about the car and the garage and so forth. It is true that that doesn't make you any more of a Christian being in church. But it is also true that you are more likely to find a car in a garage than in your living room. And you are more likely to find a Christian in church than anywhere else. So think about it that way. For the same reason that a car can, can be found in a garage, because that's where it belongs and that's where it goes, you can find a Christian in church because that's where it belongs and that's where it goes. Now we're going to unpack some scripture this morning to talk about that a little bit more, but to me that was the best response I could come up with. Well, you can find a garage and a car in a lot of places. You can find a Christian in a lot of places, but more, you're more than likely to find it in church than somewhere else. Now, that doesn't address the issue that obviously some people have objections to the church because the church has been slandered. You know, we've got stories of sexual abuse and misappropriation of funds and all these things about churches. The church is not perfect and will not be till Jesus Christ returns and restores it and redeems it. He has intended it to be a place where people can be helped and healed and made whole and given purpose and so forth. We've talked about all this stuff in previous weeks. So we should go back and explore the origin and the purpose of the church and then ask the question if being part of it is important. Why is the church even here? How did it get here? You remember back to the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when God goes to Abraham and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. You know, your descendants will number the sands on the seashore, the stars in the heavens. And through you, I will bless all the peoples of the earth. Keep that part in mind. That was the beginning. In my mind, that's the beginning of God coming to one, this one man, Abraham, and says, you're going to have all these descendants, and I'm going to bless the world through you. Now, if we go through the Old Testament all that quickly, you see that Abraham's descendants became the nation of Israel. And all those Old Testament books that we read, that is still God's intent, that through the nation of Israel, God was going to bless the peoples of the earth through a Messiah, through a Redeemer through a Savior and so forth. Fast forward to the New Testament after Jesus comes and says, I am the Messiah. I am the redemption that you have been longing for. Then the church, the, as we kind of know it in the New Testament, begins in Acts chapter, in the, well, in the beginning of Acts, really Acts 1 and 2. And that calling that God gave to Abraham and to Israel is now given to the New Testament church. So we fast forward to the passage in Acts that's filled with the history of the early church. It's like if you if you ever read the book of Acts, it's just like a history of what the first church was like. So I want us to take note. You've, we've read this passage so many times. Acts chapter 2. This is on the screen for you. 42 to 47. This is what is happening of this group of people that God has said you're going to bless the entire nation, the entire world. It says these people there devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now the number of times we've gone through this passage and broke those four things down is really a purpose statement for what is the purpose of the church. They devoted themselves to teaching, to the breaking of bread, and to communion and to prayer. It says, and also here's what's going on. Verse, this is the next verse. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. This is what's going on in the church. Keep this in mind. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. The next verse. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, one thing we need to clarify real quick here is that where are they at? In their homes, right? So church, as we think about it, is not necessarily a building, although in our day and age, when people talk about church, they think of a physical location with a building where people are gathered, all right? But we realize that the church is really a group of people called together by God. He says, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, why would you want that? Why would you want to be a part of that? Now let's ask the question, is it important that I go to church? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So this church that God created from the days of Abraham has carried forward to the New Testament, finds itself meeting together in homes every day for these four things. Listening to teaching, worshiping, sharing communion, and praying together. So let's examine what has already happened in our room this morning. We began this morning, brethren, we have met to worship. A reminder of the point. We're not here to just shake hands and hug. We are here to worship a God who is greater than us. Come thou fount of every blessing. God, we invite you to be a part of this message. Would your spirit, when I prayed this morning, may your spirit be here and move and work in us. Chris read to us from Psalm 122, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There's four or five places in the Psalms where it says that. So when you go to church, you have the opportunity to join together with people of faith, right, who claim faith. It's a, it's a powerful enough force for them that they get up on Sunday morning, they get dressed, and they go there. Or Saturday can be whatever day it wants to be. There's none of that. We don't have a specific day in Scripture. But it's people who are like-minded in faith, have a strong enough faith that it gets them out. They're fellow believers to worship the same God in spirit and in truth, to be lifted up themselves, to encourage others to be stirred, to be challenged, to be convicted, to be strengthened, to be prayed for, to have burdens lifted, to find fellowship. And there's so many other things, to be empowered through the Holy Spirit. Why would you want any of that? So when we say, do I have to go to church, it betrays your attitude towards it already. Because if you truly wanted to be there, you would say, do I get to go to church, right? It's not, do I have to go? It sounds like a little kid. And I can remember, probably all of us as little kids that were dragged to church can remember going to church and coloring in the bulletins, right? The O's and the A's. And, uh, I think I've told you this story before. As a, as a youth, we'd sit on one side and my parents would be sitting behind us so they couldn't see that I was leaning forward on my knees and I'd cover like this like I was really concentrating and really I was trying to sleep. You know, right? We all have those stories of going to church as kids and what we're doing is we're teaching our kids that there's something valuable, there's something worthwhile investing in. Little kids don't like a lot of things that are good for them. Even as adults, we don't like a lot of things that are good for us. So the question is, you don't have to go to church, it's you get to go. Because what happens at church is better than anything that can happen to you during the week. You get the opportunity to join in worship and praise to the author of the universe. Can you do that at home? Absolutely. But something happens when the people of God are gathered together and doing it corporately. Because that's what we see is happening here in Acts chapter 2. You get a chance to share God's faithfulness to you with people who already believe and share that same idea. Let's go to that passage in Hebrews 10 that I heard this group back here. The author of Hebrews realizes the value of it. He says this in Hebrews 10. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Let's be dedicated to it. Let's, the unswervingly is just an odd word to use there. I think this is probably the only place in scripture that's used. But without steering away from it, hold on to this idea that he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on. How would you be spurred on if you're not meeting together with somebody? Let us be spurred on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Apparently, it was already happening in the time of the author of the Hebrews. Says people have just decided not to do it anymore. But let us encourage one another, even in our attendance. All the more as you see the day approaching. I wanted to read uh, a study Bible's notes on this Hebrews chapter 10 here. He says, this verse, these verses call for serious thinking about other Christians with a purpose to stir up. You're going to church to encourage someone. You're giving something to someone else. To stir up them in 
to stir them up in love and service. Christian perseverance is thus also a community endeavor. This idea that we're going to make, remember so many times we've come in here and said, God, just give us strength to make it through another week. Get us to next Sunday. This, we know that the week ahead is going to be so hard for us. We're going to need your strength this week to encourage and strengthen us. Because the church isn't full of perfect people who are energized and loving and joyful and just exuberant perseverers all the time. It's filled with people that are also hurting and broken and lonely and discouraged and depressed and mournful. And we come here to spur each other on. The, the, verse, the uh, study Bible continues, community encouragement toward perseverance requires being together. That some were neglecting this duty may have been among the motives for the author's warnings throughout this book. He talks about encouraging, voicing exhortation with the goal of strengthening another's faith. One of the reasons that we break up into small groups and pray for each other is so you can say, hey, this is, this is on my mind. I want us to pray about this. And then you can have someone in this church pray for you on that spot in that moment. That's one of the reasons why we have embraced this idea of praying for each other. We didn't used to, years ago we didn't used to do that. And I would just take your request and I would just pray and then we'd just all go home. And a lot of people feel better when the pastors prayed for them. But to me it's even more powerful when you know there are other people in that body praying for you as well. One of the interesting things that has changed in the last few years. Uh, over the last pre-pandemic I'm speaking, there were so many books and articles written on the importance of the community aspect of a church. And that is an aspect of it, but it was, those books were being written to, because community was a buzzword among younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, whatever we're going to call them. Well, I haven't seen any of those books in several years because that kind of faded away because the church's, the way it shifts, its ministry kind of shifts as well. But it was one of the most talked aspects about the church. So how do we get to... An answer today, if we want to respond, it is written. We read Acts chapter 2 and we saw what the practice of the church was. Hebrews 10, and the author said, don't neglect it. Think about it this way. When someone asks Jesus, what were the two greatest commandments? You know what he said, right? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor as yourself unless you're with your neighbor and encouraging them. And that's kind of one of the reasons that we get together here. Uh, I did read an interesting article. You'll see this in the links uh, for the email tomorrow. Um, I don't know if this was a book or just the article, but Dr. Josh Boyce, I don't know his name, Boyce, says that we need the church. He said five things, and if you're going to write it down, this would be good, or it'll be in the notes for you tomorrow. We need the church for these things. Worship. Uh, often when we come together, well, almost every time we come together, we sing, we worship, we read scripture, all that sorts of things. It needs... People need the church for spiritual development. You need to be challenged to move forward, to make progress in your, work, in your walk with Christ. Thirdly, Christ-centered friendship, one of the things that Karen's pointed out to us this morning. Right? We need people that view the world through a scriptural lens, that understand things, that understand the hardships we weigh, the way, the hardships that we have, the way that scripture and God would have us to see them and to view them and to deal with them. Fourthly, biblical leadership. There's so many, we talked about the book of 1 Timothy earlier this year, and there's so many prescriptions that Paul has in there for who's going to be able to lead a church. And fifthly, for missions, to be engaged, to serve. It's not very often that someone just says, sits in their living room and says, you know what, I'm going to go volunteer. It does happen. But one of the things about the church is that it keeps us engaged and involved. We know every year we're going to do this event, we're going to reach this community, we're going to do this sort of thing, whether it be school or um, uh, trunk or treat or whatever it may be we know that we're going to try to engage our community with these sorts of things I began to think about this uh, this week and I thought perhaps the best way for us to answer this question would be not for me to answer it but for us to ask people whose churches were closed and I think some still are in some places people whose churches were closed during the pandemic what did they miss about church why do they wish that the doors were open? Maybe, and I've heard the examples of this, maybe we should go to people who can't attend due to health or age or disability or whatever, maybe, and ask them why they would want to be in church. What do they miss about church? They'd probably give you a better answer. And when churches began to reopen after the pandemic, there was a debate, at least among smaller churches, for those of us who it was really a stretch to stream technologically and so forth, about whether we would continue it or not now that we were back in person. And we did for a while. And I saw, I began to see responses. People were responding to their own churches about, well, don't stop because 
you know, so-and-so comes from X amount of places or X amount of people are now watching. And that's really hard to measure, by the way. But people that were still unable to go to church, had disabilities or whatever, were now glad that their church was streaming and they could watch it. And they would decrying this idea that churches would stop. Well, I can speak for, at least for us, and for at least a few other churches, that we don't stream our services on Sunday anymore. You know, I do a, a midweek, we do a, a Facebook Live once in a while, a couple times a week. But we don't stream the service. The service that, that is online now is being recorded right now, and it will be posted on Monday morning. And we stopped it for a few reasons. One was technologically it became even more difficult when we were in the other end of the building and all of my communications equipment and streaming was close, I could reach it. Now it's 50 feet in the back of the room. That was the first reason. The second reason was as I thought about what was the importance of church, I, I thought we should encourage people, if you're able, to come back to church. And I've talked with other pastors who felt the same. And I also realized that there are elements of our church that we streamed for a while when we were not able to be together at all. Then there's elements that we stopped streaming altogether. And of the four things that we talked about in Acts chapter 2 verse 42, three of those are not streamed at all by us anymore. So what happens when the camera goes off cannot be described because there are a lot of things that we don't, we don't stream our prayer times. We didn't stream or record the small group time that you guys had and we don't stream our worship. You can go get worship anywhere and it'll be much better than me singing and much better than our playing. There's high quality preach, and you can do the same thing for preaching as well. High quality preaching and worship everywhere. But one of the reasons we stopped is because we realized that there's, there isn't a value of us being gathered together. Some of the you can't just go online and stream and get at home. There's a very personal element to what happens in the room. Something indescribable happens when the people of God come together. You remember Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, there I am with them, right? Church is the place where we go to set our minds on things above and have our minds renewed. Church is the place where we can find mercy in the time of need and forgiveness. Church is the place where we recover hope and perseverance amidst our daily struggles. Church is the place where we gain the strength to overcome sin and temptation. Church is the place where we experience grace greater than all our sin. And God's people said, church should be the place where we find that grace of forgiveness. Those of us who are in the room know that we're all sinners saved by grace. We realize that we're not that good. And one of the accusations that people outside the church have is, oh, it's filled with goody two-shoes. That's the exact opposite. It's filled with people who know that we're broken, sinful beings who need help. When the soul is thirsty, God's house is the fountain of living water. He's the source of refreshment. We go to church because we're thirsty and hungry and desperate for God. Because we need him and his spirit and his word and his power and each other to make it another week. Church is where the fount of every blessing is poured out and the people of God can drink their fill. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? In a time and in a world when truth is distorted, when information is conflicting, when sin and evil are tolerated and even condoned, when our human nature is encouraged to do whatever it wants to do, when hearts and relationships and families are broken, when people are confused, and depressed and discouraged. The world cries out for peace and hope. If there was ever a time when the church needs each other for encouragement and wisdom and courage and discernment, it is now. The church is still a very powerful influence in the world. I believe that the church is still the greatest force 
of good in the world and may be the reason that God's judgment is being withheld. For all the rhetoric and all the accusations against the church, it still remains the largest benevolent organization in the world with branches in nearly every country. God has created the church and he loves it. He created it for us and for himself. I'm going to end the recording in just a few minutes, but the work of the church, blessing and praying for each other will continue. And anyone who's watching us on video, we invite you to join us. You're more than welcome. We've got plenty of seats. You can join us for worship and fellowship and communion and encouragement and prayer. If you're not able to join us, I want to encourage you to be a part of a local church somewhere close to you. I can't stress to you how important it is. So to conclude this morning, the Bible does not explicitly say that you have to go to church. But the pattern that God has created for his people, the creation of the early church, show us that it is a place that God intended for us to be. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.